What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Risen 2, the sequel of course to the original Risen title, with this particular entry making a variety of changes to the core gameplay setup that was apparent in Risen that sets it apart as a very different game, let's say. But before we get into all that, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that I cover, there is a video linked in the description below that will go over it. And if you're not subscribed and go to my page, it's also the first video that you'll see. My Steam profile is also public and linked in the description below as well. Though, speaking of achievements, in the case of Risen 2, all of the achievements are in fact working. However, there were at one time a variety of bugged achievements that simply would not work, and those were removed. So while all of the achievements now are very much so attainable. A few of them are still a little awkward in their unlocking, as the counter for them will reset if you exit the game session. However, your progress will persist through reloaded saves. So things like the pick 100 locks achievement, you usually have to find a nice set of locks to pick, reload, do it again and again, and sort of save scum your way through a couple of those achievements, which is certainly a little tedious, but honestly nothing new as far as this channel goes, so I thought I'd give it a mention. But to actually dive into this thing, first and foremost, hard to talk about Risen 2 without spoiling at least a little bit of Risen, which is kind of a given, but do be aware of that. Risen 2, though, sees us continuing the role of our character from the first game, who despite the very different appearance is in fact intended to be the same person, after the Isle of Faranga was all but destroyed in the aftermath of the first game. The second title, however, takes things in a much different direction, both thematically as well as mechanically. As if you haven't figured it out by the footage on screen just yet, Risen 2 is a pirate-themed adventure. Probably worth a mention that while Risen 1 and 2 were being developed, Pirates of the Caribbean's uh, interest, let's say, was at an all-time high, so you'd find a lot of pirate-themed stuff, and while it might might not be directly related, it does seem at least a little coincidental. And while a pirate theme for a new game wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, they also made a variety of mechanical changes to the game as well. A largely simplified character progression and several removed features that were in the first game, such as the varieties of magic available to you that are just straight up gone from the sequel. In fact, you can find a joke referring to their removal in-game, actually. So all of our magic is replaced with the new mechanic of voodoo, and many of our ranged options were replaced with guns. So needless to say, right out of the gate, Risen 2 has made a lot of changes to the sort of core experience that people expected, which goes a good way to explaining the rather polarizing reception of this title. Some people really enjoyed it, while a lot of people also felt that it wasn't really a great follow-up to Risen as it basically overrode everything they set up with the first game, which is also kind coupled with a lot of jank and some technical issues that are pretty common for Piranha Bytes, to be honest. So, not a huge surprise, though. Some of that does absolutely persist to this day, as the game crashed relatively frequently while I was doing this review, and it crashed somewhat reliably when I would go to Switch Islands, which is a feature we'll get into. So I often just started saving right before I would Switch Islands or travel somewhere new, because there was like a 50-50 shot of the game just crashing outright every single single time, which as you might imagine gets annoying pretty quick. So before you even begin playing, there's a lot to keep in mind about this game. But once you actually get to playing, we can focus on the story setup and my thoughts on it. Now the narrative of Risen 2 I actually think is very much so relevant to the themes and everything that were brought up in the original game. It follows on to things that they had laid the groundwork for in the first game, which does a lot of heavy lifting for the story. But when we start the game, we are working for the Inquisition, holed up in a sort of last bastion of humanity after the Titan Lords have begun their rampage, as we knew they would, and began destroying much of the land around us. This has left humanity and other civilizations with almost nowhere to go, really, hence the last bastion here. Now, the people of this area would like to head to a new world, however, they can't even escape by sea to do this because that is being blocked by a Titan Lord known as Mara, who has used a Kraken 
trying to effectively terrorize the waters that make sailing to this new world basically impossible, as Mara controls much of the sea. And the two Titan lords duking it out to the north that we never actually see have made traveling that way impossible, hence our need to escape. Naturally, at the start of the game, an opportunity arises to do just that, via the arrival of Patty after her ship is destroyed by the Kraken in the harbor. Patty being a recurring character from the first game who is herself a pirate. She brings news to Caldera here that there might be an option to get rid of the Kraken. Via a series of Titan artifacts, that were held by various pirate captains throughout the area, and if we go find them, we might just be able to stop this Kraken and get everyone to safety somewhere else. So, in order to facilitate this plan, you are kicked out of the Inquisition in name. Technically, you are still working for the Inquisition, but they strip you of your rank and everything to make it look like you were well and truly thrown out, so you can infiltrate the pirates, so you do become an actual pirate relatively early on, and then you use that stat to track down the artifacts to ultimately bring the fight to Mara. However, along the way, of course, we get to do all sorts of fun pirate shenanigans that see us potentially joining one of two factions, which is the Inquisition again, which is a kind of bizarre decision to me, or the Natives. Each one of them represents a choice in terms of your combat capabilities, either the ability to use muskets or voodoo, respectively, along with the more traditional Piranha Bytes approach of various ways to complete individual quests, things like pickpocketing, various speech options, that kind of thing, all while we facilitate this journey. Along the way, we meet all sorts of recurring characters from the original game, which is mostly pretty fun. However, the game is a bit more linear in this regard than the previous entries up to this point. Rather than an open world to explore, we are given a sort of series of hub areas that we travel to by ship, of course, with each one of them typically being an island. The beginning of the game is very linear. You don't really have many options here. However, a short ways into it, you will eventually be able to freely travel between all of the islands available to you, and it does open up a little bit more, but compared to their other games, this one is a bit more linear. Broadly speaking, however, I did enjoy the story for this one quite a bit. The game certainly has some faults, and we'll get into those. Most of the story is pretty fun, with my main complaint being that while I did enjoy it, it nonetheless abandons a lot of stuff that Risen 1 had set up in favor of going all in on this pirate narrative, which was also set up in the original, to be fair, but a lot of other things like the mages, and the Inquisitors just get completely tossed to the side, which becomes the first of many instances where Risen 2 is fun enough, but it doesn't really feel like a great sequel to that first title. Which brings us relatively naturally to character progression. Progression in this game is much different from all of the other Piranha Bytes games I've played up to this point, which at this point is everything but Risen 3. However, we still have attributes, talents, and skills. We have five attributes, Blades, firearms, toughness, cunning, and voodoo. When we defeat enemies in combat or complete quests, we earn glory, which acts as experience, and once we have enough, we can spend that experience on one of these four attributes. The cost to level them up does increase the more you increase the individual attributes. So the first level is 1,000 glory, the next is 2,000, etc., with it increasing a bit more towards the later levels, though they effectively max out at 10 each. And unless you're grinding, you're not going to get all of these maxed out in one playthrough. However, raising your attributes increases the talents associated with that particular attribute. Each of the attributes is in charge of three talents, and increasing the attribute raises the base level of the talents associated with it. Blades will, of course, increase the talent for various types of weaponry. Cunning, increasing your ability to pick locks or pickpocket, as well as your ability to charm people, etc. Many skill checks in the game use talents as the way to do that. For instance, you can't pick a lock unless you have a certain level of thievery. You can't intimidate someone unless your intimidate is at a certain level, all the usual stuff. But then we have skills. In order to learn skills, you need to find a trainer while also having the appropriately leveled attribute as well as any prerequisite skills already learned. This will also cost you gold. And the skills themselves are what enable you to do a lot of the more interesting stuff, but many of them just increase your talent level even further. For instance, getting the thievery skills for the cunning attribute 
contribute will simply increase your thievery talent even farther, which helps you specialize in it. Once talents reach around level 90 to 100, that's pretty much end game level. It can go over 100, however it's pretty easy to get to 100 to begin with, and that's all you need. Even when it comes to damage, that is basically in game damage, you can definitely do everything with a skill near that level. And that makes up the core of our progression systems, but we're not done there. Because the game also features about 20 or so legendary items. Finding these will increase a specific thing permanently. These are simply items you find out in the world, and having them gives you permanent increases to your talents or your attributes. They also are not particularly difficult to find, as you can read books, which will give you hints about their location, which is marked in your journal, which all but tells you where to go to find them. And then we have the actual equipment system. Compared to Piranha Bytes' previous entries, the equipment system is relatively limited here. It's also not limited by your faction either, so things like great armor or great weapons do not need to be found by a particular faction. The only real exception to this is easier access to some things early on, though more on that in just a little bit. Equipment itself can also bolster your talents though, and all of these things together combine to make what I would say one of Piranha Bytes' easiest games. The progression system is very simple, it has multiple ways to be increased, and while previous games up to this point, and even some of their later games with Elix, you could do just about everything if you sort of min-maxed. In Risen 2 here, that is simply not necessary. Just by finding all the legendary items and spending your glory, you'll probably passively max most of this stuff out, even the stuff you aren't trying to use. And while that certainly isn't a bad thing in and of itself, in doing all of this, they did kind of remove a lot of the build diversity as a result. So in previous games, there was a sort of variety of approaches be that ranged, melee, magic builds, etc. That is vastly reduced in Risen 2 here, where basically every character winds up becoming a jack-of-all-trades with the exception of muskets and voodoo. In spite of that, though, they did add a few things that were a lot of fun to engage with, and many of the sort of staples of the magic system were replaced with equally interesting options. For instance, in this game, if your cunning is high enough, you can get a trained monkey who acts as a sort of thief for you. You can send it into closed spaces to go grab things or steal things out of a house, that kind of thing, which is an expansion of the transform spells that would allow you to clear obstacles in previous games, which is a fun little mechanic to engage with. But at the same time, things like offensive magic just aren't here anymore, which feels like the appropriate place to get into the combat section. As I already mentioned, a lot of the build diversity has been pretty reduced, but what little diversity there is is down to your faction choice. You see, early in the game, you will pick between the native and the Inquisition. However, this particular choice does not have a very large impact on anything besides voodoo and firearms. It changes a couple of the main quests in a subtle way, but beyond that, everything plays out the same way. You don't really get any other special advantages for being one faction or the other. It's still a relatively impactful choice in terms of your build, because in terms of damage, Inquisition is the way to go. Getting access to the musket is just playing this game on easy mode, and it wasn't that difficult to begin with, especially when you start getting muskets that are double-barreled, which allows you to shoot twice before you have to reload, which is effectively just a short cooldown, and the musket does massive damage anyway, and your pistol, which is available to you no matter what, is also on a separate cooldown, which can be alternated with the musket as well, which lets you just destroy enemies later. But on the flip side of that, we have the natives who can teach you voodoo if you side with them. In terms of roleplay, I think the natives are the better choice, as they are effectively being treated like slaves by the Inquisition, and given the state of the rest of the world, fighting against these titans and everything, the Inquisition being sort of just deliberately at war with the natives just because seems particularly silly to me. However, the voodoo, while cool, isn't really that great, unfortunately. It's much more about control over your enemies than it is outright damage, and for a game where dealing damage wasn't really 
really a high bar to clear anyway. I think Voodoo is still very viable, but it is much less powerful. Though it will allow you to curse enemies, to weaken them, summon a ghost ally even, or potentially take control of characters in certain story instances, or even augment your abilities through potion making. However, in spite of this faction choice, Voodoo and Firearms are not by any means locked off from you just because. For instance, if you don't join the Inquisition, you can still very much so get your hands on a musket. It will just take you a tiny bit longer, and you won't be able to train it to the max as the trainer that will be able to max it out for you simply won't allow you to do so. And while if you join the Inquisition, you can not actually learn voodoo, or at least the more important parts of it, you can still learn to make potions, which is covered under the voodoo section as well. And while that sounds good, Potions kind of suck in this game anyway, as most of them just increase your talents, which is simply unnecessary with the sheer volume of ways you already had to do that, which means potions are really only useful for the permanent potions that increase your talent points permanently. However, finding the plants that do that already give you a plus one to that, and making the potion only increases that to plus two, again, in a game where this stuff is widely available, making that just completely unnecessary. So that all around, I I think makes Voodoo a very mechanically uninteresting option, especially in terms of combat, which is too bad because the theme for it I think was really well done. The rest of combat, however, is pretty much the same for everyone. For the most part, you've got a one-handed melee weapon, a pistol in your offhand, or potentially what is known as a dirty trick, which is things like equipped sand you can throw in people's eyes or a coconut that can potentially knock people out, with the offhand being on a cooldown usually pistols being a relatively long one. There are a few sort of two-handed options that are your throwing spears or your muskets. However, you have a hotbar, you can quickly swap between all this stuff pretty freely, so having one thing equipped or another isn't like some big impactful decision. Just hotbar the thing you want to switch to and you're good to go. And while combat in this game is not particularly difficult to do solo, you do have access to companions throughout almost the entirety of the game. There are a couple of fights that you are required to do solo. Almost everything else can be done with a variety of companions you will have access to, the first of which being Patty. None of them are incredibly memorable, so I'm not going to list them or anything, but you will have access to companions to help you, which makes basically everything doable right from the beginning of the game, as they effectively act as a meat shield for you. So, all in all, I would say combat is decent. It has some fun things going for it. It's fun to play around with certain options. However, combat in Piranha Bytes games has never exactly been stellar, and that's not really any different here. It's still a little bit janky. However, there is one aspect of the melee combat I wanted to mention having said that. In the prior two games up to this, that is to say Gothic 3 and Risen, Piranha Bytes were trying to make a melee system that worked off of blocking, parrying, dodging out of the way, etc. all at the right time. And in the previous two games they made, I don't think that really worked very well. In Gothic 3's case, this is because things like the animals were just flat out broken, or in Risen 1, the enemies attacked so fast that there was no telegraph to it, which means you were effectively just guessing what the enemy was going to do in melee. Whereas here in Risen 2, that system actually does work. You can watch an enemy and get an idea for when it is going to attack, which will allow you to either block or potentially execute a parry and a counterattack, which means if you get pretty good at it, which honestly isn't necessary due to all of the damage damage sources you can get. Nonetheless, if you get good at that particular melee aspect, you can take on some very tough enemies very early. So having played those other games relatively recently, it was nice to see that system actually working here, but that doesn't really change anything else about the combat that I've mentioned up to this point, or the fact that the combat itself is somewhat weightless, let's say. Nonetheless, though, the guns are pretty fun to mess around with. All of that, though, does finally bring us to our world and gameplay section. The world the world of Risen 2 uses a sort of hub system. You'll be jumping around from island to island fairly regularly, with each island or coastal area representing a small hub that will have a variety of quests for you to partake in, many of which are open-ended in how you approach them.
system, which does give a pretty good variety in terms of both gameplay, in terms of the skills and the things you're utilizing to actually reach your goal. And this hub system does allow a lot of that stuff to be more densely packed than the previous open worlds. As a result of that, exploring around these hub areas tends to be pretty rewarding, with many of the locations themselves also being themed, showing us things like deserted islands, thick jungles, or potentially even strongholds of the Inquisition, that kind of stuff, which all does give a very strong theme to this game. That theme is, of course, pirates, though, and if you don't like pirate stuff, this game isn't going to do it for you, I would say. However, at the same time, a lot of the game feels very different than Piranha Byte's previous titles, and in many ways it feels a lot more like a traditional third-person action RPG, with many of the systems and mechanics that made Piranha Byte's previous games feel unique simply being absent or removed or replaced with something, I would say, more generic feeling. And in many ways, I think a little bit of the magic of a lot of the other games that I've played, and even that their later titles after this, like Elix, I think captured in a much better way. And for me, I would say that's probably the biggest downside to Risen 2. But I nonetheless had a lot of fun with it as I haven't really messed around with anything so deliberately pirate-themed since, I would say, Deadfire, probably. So a lot of that was just fun to engage with for me, if nothing else. Though, before we start wrapping it up, that does finally bring us to the DLC section. So, there are two content DLCs, and then one of them just being a sort of outfit, which is largely pointless. The two content DLCs are known as the Air Temple, as well as Treasure Isle, both of which are relatively small in nature. Treasure Isle does give you a variety of quests that span much of the rest of the game, culminating in a extra location for you to travel to and earn a lot of treasure in the process, while also bringing to a close the plot thread involving Patty and her father Steelbeard and her inheritance, so to speak, that was set up in the first game. The other entry is the Air Temple. This sees the return of the Druid Eldrick from the first game as well, who informs you of a potential threat via swarming gargoyles, and he would like your help in stopping that. Doing so requires you to travel to the Air Temple, fight a bunch of gargoyles before traveling around to all of the other islands and clearing them of the gargoyle infestation. Basically, this just adds a bunch more enemies for you to fight and give you a little bit more to do. Truth be told, I would tell you both both of these DLCs are a little underwhelming, and each of them individually adds maybe a couple hours to the experience, which isn't that wild. That, however, brings us to the Steam Deck section, and normally I would have footage up on screen here for you, but for some reason, like many of Piranha Bytes games, this one really didn't like being recorded on the Steam Deck in particular. However, the game is playable on Steam Deck, but it's not a wonderful experience, I would say. And this is down to the relatively limited feature set meaning only partial controller support, which on the Steam Deck isn't that useful, the lack of cloud saves, meaning that you can't transfer progress from your regular PC onto the Steam Deck very easily, but the biggest problem by far is the controls themselves, with the sort of default layout for the game just not working at all, and even a lot of the other regular templates are only going to give you partial functionality, which means in order to use this on the Steam Deck effectively, you're either going to have to get familiar with a community layout of which there are a few, or you're going to have to manually map the keys in-game to the Steam Deck controls by yourself, which can be very tedious. If you are willing to put up with that, however, yes, it is very much so playable on Steam Deck, but it's certainly not the best experience of this game. That, though, does finally bring us to our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So, on the positive side of things, I enjoyed the story. It's not exactly groundbreaking or anything, especially by today's standards. However, However, they did a lot of fun stuff with it, things that I really haven't seen Piranha Bytes do anywhere else, and it was fun. The story was fun. I enjoyed it. And that even extends to some of the new gameplay features, such as having the monkey go around and steal things for you. You can even get a parrot. The melee combat actually works, even if the combat itself isn't anything special. So a lot of those little additions were fun, and they would have been even better for me if they were simply in addition to the things that were established in Risen 1. Which brings us to my negatives. Now, first and foremost, the craft 
crashes. The technical state of this game, even years on, or probably because of how old it is at this point even, is rough. This game crashed consistently. It's also janky and a little bit buggy here and there, which is hardly unusual for Piranha Bytes games, or a lot of the games I play on this channel, honestly. But the ones you're likely to run into are very annoying and very noticeable. But perhaps my biggest negative for this personally is simply that it's a bad sequel. While I enjoyed the game overall, and I had a fun time with it, as I noted in several cases, as a sequel, it's not great. And this is because they abandoned a lot of the stuff they set up in that first game to where it feels like I'm playing a different genre of game, even though it's not that different. They tossed out the magic. You can't find a bow anywhere. They got rid of the staff fighting, even. And to my mind, a sequel should expand upon the features and gameplay as it goes. And while obviously that's not true for every franchise, in a game like this that is a direct continuation of the story, I think it really should be. And all of that does bring us to my conclusion. To put it relatively simply, I would say Risen 2 is a good game. I enjoyed it. As a standalone title, I think it would have been even more enjoyable though, because as a sequel, I don't think it's good at all. I think it's actually pretty disappointing, because for everything I liked here, they strip out something from Risen 1. And as a matter of personal preference, I preferred a lot of what they did in Risen 1, so for someone like myself, that's a pretty big deal. However, I can easily see some people playing Risen 2 here and enjoying it much more than that first title which is, again, just going to come down to preference, I would say. However, doing that with a sequel really divides your fan base, which is why you're going to hear polarizing reports about Risen 2. In a vacuum, though, I do think it's an enjoyable experience. However, in terms of a recommendation this many years on, it sells for $20 with all the DLC, which honestly is a little much for this title given the age of it and the technical state of it, so I would advise you to wait for a sale simply because that's the prudent thing to do at this point, and the game is regular on sale, so it's not hard to get. And to put that in perspective for you, I personally bought this game on sale like four or five months ago when I was planning to review it eventually, and I paid $1.87 for this game and all of its DLC, and for a price like that, it's real hard to complain. But that, I think, is pretty much going to wrap up my thoughts and opinions on Risen 2. So if you reached this point in the video, truly, thank you for watching and listening to me rant on about this. It really is appreciated. So, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Again, thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.